Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining me here today. This is the VHI Postgraduate Seminar Series. My name is Andrew, and I'm from the Magic CRISPR Laboratory here at VHI. And the title of my talk is The Use of CRISPR-Cas Systems as Diagnostic Tools. So I'm going to start my talk by introducing uh, CRISPR-Cas9 itself. Now, CRISPR-Cas9 arguably is the most uh, famous and most renowned uh, Cas protein of the CRISPR-Cas systems. Uh, many of you would have learned about it in undergraduate and even used it here at, uh, in your postgraduate studies. So here's Cas9, the Cas9 nuclease in blue, and in dark blue is its guide RNA sequence. The guide RNA sequence is a 20 nucleotide guide sequence that guides the Cas9 complex to anywhere you want in the genome. And this Cas9 complex, once it binds to its uh, complementary target DNA, then has uh, two endonuclease domains, the rough C1 and H and H uh, endonuclease domains, that is able to cleave the DNA double-stranded uh, target uh, to result in a blunt uh, cut and a double-stranded break. This then results in gene editing as essentially what we're using in the magic uh, CRISPR laboratory to generate gene modified mice. So to date, we've generated more than 300 unique mouse models. And what we're doing is that we're injecting the CRISPR-Cas reagents directly into the fertilized single cell embryo. Uh, this results in double stranded break and it allows us to impart deletions, uh, small insertions such as uh, V5 tags, HA tags, lag tags, uh, conditional alleles such as uh, these fluxing projects and large targeting projects where we have the insertion of reporters, we can also humanize entire genes, and so on. Now the CRISPR-Cas9 toolkit is actually extremely diverse. Um, apart from gene editing and double-stranded breaks, what people have done is they've also generated DCAS9 nucleus null versions of this protein. Essentially, you have a single point mutation in the rough C1 and HNH endonuclease domains. And that results in a Cas9 which can't cleave DNA anymore. And what we can then use it for is as a scaffold for other fusion proteins and direct this complex to anywhere in the genome that you want. So these fusion proteins can include uh, the CRAB proteins, which are transcriptional repressors, VP64, which is an activator, uh, Apoback proteins. Uh, we can also uh, do epigenetic modifications. Um, and also fluorophores to look at um, DNA replication kinetics and so on. The Cas9 variant that you would have used in your work is SPCAS9, also known as Streptococcus pyogenes Cas9. SPCAS9 is just one of very many Cas9 orthologs in the type 2A system in red, and also there are other Cas9 orthologs in blue, which is a type 2B, and also type 2C systems in green. So you can appreciate the really great diversity of Cas9 orthologs uh, that are out there in the many different bacteria and archaea species. So that's where Cas9 sits. So it's in a type 2 and class 2 of the CRISPR-Cas9 systems. But there are also a few different other types. So there are six different types of CRISPR-Cas systems in class 1 and class 2, so two classes uh, altogether. And the ones that we'll be focusing on today in this talk is uh, Cas12, 13, and 14. So these are type 5 and type 6 uh, CRISPR-Cas proteins uh, for the very fact that they are used in CRISPR-Cas diagnostics. Uh, the feature that they all have that uh, makes them so suitable for diagnostics is that they have this collateral cleavage activity, which we will discuss more in detail. So these are the crystal structures of Cas12, 13, and 14. Uh, Cas12, like Cas9, cleaves DNA. Cas13 is unique because rather than cleaving DNA, it cleaves RNA. And Cas14 as well cleaves DNA. Most of the studies that we've done in our laboratory uh, feature Cas12, so that's what we'll be focusing mostly on today, and to a lesser extent, Cas13. So as we've mentioned, Cas9, once it uh, binds to its double-stranded DNA target, makes a double-stranded break. And there's some studies to show that Cas9 remains bound to its double-stranded uh, target after cleavage. The guide RNA for Cas9 is relatively long. It's about 120 nucleotides in length. But for Cas12, the guide RNA is quite a bit shorter. It's only 44 or 45 nucleotides in length. 
And like Cas9, Cas12 binds to its double-stranded DNA target and makes a double-stranded break. Um, but the unique thing about Cas12 is that it, in most cases, it releases its double-stranded uh, target. And once it cuts its uh, double-stranded target, it has um, this state whereby it gets activated and it can then cleave all other single-stranded DNA in solution in a non-specific fashion. So this is also known as a trans cleavage activity and also known as a collateral uh, single-stranded DNA cleavage activity. So this is the crystal structure of Cas12 again, and this is the rough C domain. So that is the main that is the domain that's uh, responsible for um, uh, cleaving the on-target double-stranded DNA, but also uh, for the collateral single-strand DNA activity. So here we'll talk a bit, a little bit uh, more about the Cas12 DNA cleavage uh, mechanisms. So here's Cas12 in gray, and it's bound to its guide RNA. In the presence of a specific double-stranded DNA, we have uh, PAM recognition and strand invasion, so the unraveling of the DNA double helix. Uh, we then have the rough C domain of Cas12A making double-stranded breaks. And once it makes a double-stranded break, it becomes activated into this state where it then gains this collateral single-strand DNA cleavage activity, and it cleaves any single-stranded DNA that's present in solution, irrespective of what that sequence is. It doesn't have to be complementary to the guide sequence. And much like how double-stranded DNA can act as an on-target DNA, single-stranded DNA can also act as an on-target DNA for uh, the Cas12A complex whereby if this is complementary to the guide sequence, uh, you don't need a PAM sequence at all. You then get cleavage of the on-target single-stranded DNA. And likewise, it then gets activated into this activated state and cleaves all other single-stranded DNAs uh, that are present in solution. So this is how we implement the Cas12A proteins in our diagnostic assay workflow. So here we're starting with a pathogenic DNA in blue which is then amplified by PCR or LAMP amplification. I'll talk a little bit more about LAMP later on. So once this pathogenic DNA is amplified, we get lots of it. We then incubate it in solution with Cas12 that is bound to its guide RNA. And if this is complementary, then we get single-stranded uh, DNA uh, collateral cleavage activity once uh, Cas12 cleaves its on-target double-stranded DNA. Now this uh, single-stranded collateral cleavage activity can be measured um, using these reporters that we put in solution. So these reporters, they are basically single-stranded DNA that have a fluorophore uh, in close proximity to a quencher. Uh, in under baseline conditions, we get no fluorescence, but once we have single-stranded uh, cleavage, the fluorophore is separated from the quencher and we get a fluorescent uh, signal. So basically, a high fluorescent signal uh, is indicative of high Cas12A single-stranded uh, collateral cleavage activity, and that in itself is indicative of the presence of a target or pathogen DNA. So it's actually a really si simple system. So to establish the Cas12A CRISPR diagnostic assay, we wanted to ask a few very basic and preliminary questions. The first is, can Cas12A be targeted to cleave a specific double-stranded DNA, as has been reported in the literature. And once it cleaves its specific on-target DNA, can it then activate its collateral single-strand DNA activity? The other thing is, can we also activate Cas12A collateral single-stranded DNA activity? Uh, instead of using a double-stranded on-target, can we use a single-strand on-target? And lastly, does this work in a high-throughput format? Can we use a plate reader for this to um, interrogate multiple samples? at once. So here is uh, the starting of our um, optimization and preliminary experiments where we start with a double-stranded DNA that we amplify by PCR. Uh, basically, we put this in complex that uh, together with Cas12A and the guide RNA. And these different guide RNAs are then able to recognize the double-stranded DNA and then cleave it. So here is uh, the lane where it's just a uh, double-stranded DNA without uh, any guide RNA. So that's uncleaved double-stranded DNA. Uh, what we then have is that in guide RNA 1, 2, 3, and 4, we get cleavage of the double-stranded DNA to result in the DNA uh, cleavage product. 
uh, we have a stagger of the guide RNAs, which are staggered in this in this fashion, and therefore we get uh, the different staggering of these uh, different product lengths. The other thing we've added into all of these uh, solutions is the presence of phage uh, single-stranded DNA. So this is high molecular weight phage DNA. And as you can see, once uh, Cas12 cleaves its on-target DNA, it then also cleaves um, single-stranded DNA in a non-specific manner. So it indeed has collateral single-stranded DNA cleavage activity because all of this um, high molecular weight single-stranded DNA, which would be present here, is now present as single-stranded DNA cleavage products, so much smaller cleavage products uh, compared to the full length. So the next thing we did was to test whether we could use a 96-well format to test um, whether we have collateral cleavage activity and whether we can use fluorescence as a readout of uh, cleavage activity. So we used this kit from Thermo Fisher where we have a fluorophore and a quencher and solution and this is then cleaved by Cas12 uh, to give you a fluorescence readout if you have collateral cleavage activity. So essentially, we did this with the PCR products and also the guide RNAs. We found that with a single guide RNA, we get a good signal after 15 to 30 minutes in solution. Uh, but interestingly, when you combine guide RNAs, um, guide one and two, we get an even stronger, more robust signal. And combining three or four guide RNAs give you um, it gives you an even stronger signal. So here we've shown that uh, Cas12a does have um, uh, DNA binding activity to double-stranded on-target DNA. Uh, the question is, can we also activate this using a uh, single-stranded DNA, uh, uh, whereby we activate its uh, collateral cleavage activity as well? And the answer is also yes. Uh, this is sense uh, guide RNA, so this um, essentially doesn't bind to the single-stranded DNA, and so it doesn't activate collateral activity. But once you have uh, antisense uh, guide RNA, which then binds to the single-stranded DNA, uh, this then activates collateral DNA activity, and you can then get this fluorescent signal here. And the same is seen for a uh, second guide RNA. So uh, basically, we've answered the preliminary questions that um, this this um, whole assay works. Uh, it works in, a, in, uh, in vitro using PCR products and so on. Uh, now we want to adapt this into a system where we can detect actual pathogens. So the first pathogen that we focused on was Mycobacterium tuberculosis, also known as TB. Uh, we picked a few TB genes, GYRA, INHA, uh, CATG, and RPRB. And we designed two guide RNAs per gene, so a total of eight guide RNAs. Uh, what we did was to first start off with uh, synthetic DNA. So we amplified synthetic DNA for uh, safety reasons and optimization reasons. Uh, we found that all of the uh, primers amplified the DNA well. We got really good and discrete uh, amplicons for all of them. And when we place these amplicons together with guide RNAs and the Cas12 proteins, we also get a really good uh, signal of uh, fluorescence. So this indicates that the system works well and it can detect uh, these um, pathogen sequences really well. Uh, several genes uh, work better, so CATG and also GORA and RPRB work a bit better than the rest of them, uh, but all of them give a really good signal. So the, um, the signal is uh, very robust as compared to the non-targeting controls, which are basically, that's your uh, baseline here uh, with um, no signal. So moving on, we then wanted to test this in um, actual uh, TB pathogen um, bacteria cells and also um, spiking this into human sputum samples. So this is representative of what you would get uh, in a clinical sampling. So we started with 1.5 million uh, TB cells and diluted that all the way down to 1,200 TB cells. And we spiked that into 500 microliters of uh, sputum. We then cleaned this up using the Quarigen DNA extraction kit. Uh, using purified DNA, we use this for PCR amplification, um, purification, and then use that in either the gene expert platform or the Cas12A detection assay uh, to see if we can detect uh, TB. 
Uh, the Gene Expert platform is uh, basically the gold standard for detecting TB. So that's why we wanted to use it to compare with our CAS12A detection system. So using this uh, workflow, we were testing about 40,000 genome equivalents of uh, TB um, to about 30 genome equivalents per TB uh, loaded um, per PCR. On the GeneXpert platform, we found that uh, the 1.5 million and 300,000 spike of TB had high uh, readings, uh, medium reading for the 30,000 spike and low readings for the 6,000 and uh, 1,200 spike. And for our CAS12A platform, in comparison, we got really good readings again for the higher dilutions, the 1.5 million and 300,000 uh, dilutions. But for the um, the lower readings, the 600, uh, sorry, the 6,000, um, 30,000, and 1,200, uh, there's still really good readings, although it's uh, quite a bit lower than the higher dilutions. But the um, uh, they still gave rise to a really uh, robust and strong signal um, uh, for CAT-G guide. This was a bit lower for GYRA and RPOB, but uh, there's still clearly uh, presence of of this signal. So this shows that the uh, system works well for TB and we can expand it to other pathogens. The next one we wanted to test was a Bordetella pertussis. So this is a bacteria that's responsible for whooping cough. So this is pertussis here and is um, closely related to other Bordetella species such as parapertussis. Um, and also there are a few other Bordetella species in, um, in, in this family. This is the assay that we uh, established where we could easily detect Bordetella pertussis. This is genomic DNA of the pathogen itself. Uh, this is also Bordetella pertussis in red. This is synthetic DNA, so it detects that really well. Um, it detected parapertussis, which is the uh, closely related family member to a smaller extent, uh, but none of the other Bordetella species were detected. So that shows that you can, with a good guide RNA design, um, have a really um, a specific signal to um, certain species uh, that you want to test and discriminate that um, uh, as compared to the other uh, family members. The next thing we wanted to do was to establish a multiplex assay where we can detect multiple pathogens in one detection reaction. So to do that, what we used was uh, CAS12A and used it in parallel with CAS13 to detect pertussis and also TB. So individually, you see these um, detection assays work well. So this is CAS12A uh, using a hex reporter to detect pertussis. This is CAS13A using a FAM reporter to detect TB. And when we combine them together in a single uh, solution, they will both work really well. They both gave uh, a reading for uh, CAS13A using the FAM reporter and CAS12A with the hex reporter, um, showing that you can use multiplex assays to detect multiple uh, pathogens at once, which uh, really um, accelerates and increases the throughput of these detection assays. So once we've detected um, TB and pertussis, we wanted to show that we can expand this to detect a wide variety of other pathogens uh, with the simple premise and concept that as long as you have genomic information, genomic sequence information of the pathogens that you're interested in, you can very, very readily and easily scale up the detection uh, platform to detect all of these uh, pathogens at once. So what we did was to look at the genomic sequences for all of these virus uh, species, um, fungal species, and also bacteria. We designed uh, one or two guide RNAs per pathogen, and then we tested that in our assays. And what we found is that we got really good readings for um, all of these viruses, um, adenoviruses, EBV, H1N1, um, and also the ones for the fungal uh, F. Solani, uh, and also bacteria S. auris uh, guide RNAs all work really well. So that shows that um, it's really a dynamic um, system where you can just um, simply order your guide RNAs to your pathogen within two weeks or less, have an assay established and set up for it. And it was just this time that we were uh, doing these experiments in 2020. We were in the middle of a pandemic of SARS-CoV-2, and we thought, uh, well, it's a perfect uh, system and a perfect, perfect pathogen uh, to use uh, to see if we can detect it. So we uh, got in contact with Damon Purcell in the PDI, 
and he had SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, growing in these Vera E6 monkey cell lines. Um, these these uh, virus uh, particles were then uh, filtered, extracted, and then purified with this quarantine kit. And what we did was to use um, WHO approved um, RT-PCR protocols to amplify the virus to firstly reverse transcribe it and then PCR amplify the DNA of the virus. Uh, with this, these uh, different primer sets amplifying uh, genes such as uh, RDRP, uh, N-gene, E-gene and so on, um, as shown here in, in this uh, diagram of the virus itself. Uh, we found that using these RT-PCR primers, we could get uh, good amplification of the of the um, the virus itself uh, using uh, our VHI primers and also the other WHO primers. And putting these amplicons together um, in our Cas12A complex solution, uh, we could get really good uh, strong fluorescent readings as well. So that shows that the Cas12A system can really and rapidly detect these viral sequences. So with RT-PCR, what we're doing is that we're getting a nasal swab. So that's usually suspended in a universal uh, buffer. And that buffer is then uh, used for RNA extraction. We get the RNA out of that. Uh, we then do reverse transcription to get DNA. The DNA is then amplified by PCR. And these amplicons are then used in our CAS-12 uh, workflow. But really to develop a rapid diagnostic test, we needed to speed up this process and simplify it. So what we did was that instead of using uh, PCR, an RT-PCR, we used a technique known as RT-LAMP or loop-mediated amplification, which is what LAMP stands for. Uh, we're using RT-LAMP to do all three of these steps in a single step to make the whole process really uh, simple and fast. Um, and feed that into our Cas12A detection workflow. So I'll talk a little bit more about LAMP. Uh, so starting with the PCR in comparison, you have reverse transcription which starts at about 42 degrees. So that occurs for about um, 30 minutes or so for the RT-PCR protocol. After RT, you have the uh, cyclic phase of your reaction where you have the um, DNA itself being um, denatured, you've got primer annealing, you've got primer extension, and um, all of these, all of this happens in about 35 to 45 cycles uh, in the PCR reaction. In comparison, in RT lamp, what we're doing is that we're using an isothermal temperature for the amplification, meaning there's only a single temperature whereby all of these steps can happen um, at once. So it doesn't happen in a cyclic phase happens uh, continuously only one reaction at one temperature. So essentially stranded displacement, uh, primer annealing and primer extension um, all happen at the same time, which makes it uh, much quicker and much faster. Um, and the other advantage of RT lamp is that we can use a crude RNA or DNA in the reaction, meaning we don't have to purify um, any of the, of the samples uh, to get purified RNA. Uh, the reason is that LAMP is much more forgiving uh, on the type of uh, the quality of the RNA that you're putting in, whereas uh, PCR is much more sensitive to contaminants, and that's why we can get away with using crude material for RT LAMP. So the LAMP reaction is actually quite unique and different as compared to PCR. So rather than just two primers being present in the PCR reaction, we have up to six primers in the LAMP reaction. We then get these six primers priming and giving you these bell-shaped uh, like structures which then form these primer binding sites and self-priming sites to give you these large long concatenates. And in between these, uh, this, these bell structures, this is where your on-target double-stranded DNA is present, and that's where Cas12 binds and recognizes the on-target uh, sequences. So these concatenates, uh, they can be very long and high molecular weight, so if you run it on a gel, it's going to look quite different compared to these discrete amplicons that you get uh, in the PCR reaction. So just in summary, the RT-QPCR is starting with a swab sample. You need RNA purification, which can take about one hour or more. Uh, you need amplification, which is about two hours in detection at the same time. Uh, you need quite a bit of technical expertise for this. It's quite specialist uh, equipment that, that is needed as well. And the time to result is generally about 24 hours, or it could be even more than one day. It just depends on where you get it done. In comparison with the Cas12A RT-LAMP uh, system, 
what we're having here is that we don't need any RNA purification. So we're skipping this step altogether, going straight to amplification and then detection. So each of these steps take about five to 15 minutes. Uh, you don't need any technical expertise and the equipment is also very simple. You just basically need a water bath or a heat block. Uh, and then the time to result is uh, less than 30 minutes. So this really paves the way for rapid diagnostics, whereby you can imagine a situation where we can test an individual and have them wait for the test result um, on the spot, rather than having them go home and having this period of uncertainty before receiving their test result. So you can really uh, see the application of this in um, situations such as um, border checkpoints and um, primary care um, situations such as GP clinics and so on. So this is RT lamp that we're doing using uh, the SARS-CoV-2 material for detection. And here we're optimizing the time of the lamp reaction, the RT lamp, uh, where we are seeing um, anywhere between five to uh, 120 minutes of amplification uh, before detecting the fluorescence uh, of these of these um, of Cas12 a reporters. Uh, we can see that at five minutes and 10 minutes, we basically get a very low or no signal, but from 15 to 20 minutes onwards, you get a really strong signal and amplification of the SARS-CoV-2 sequences. Uh, with uh, 30 minutes of amplification, what we're testing here is the uh, dilutions and how low we can go to, and the limit of detection uh, of this approach. And what we can see is that from 100 nanograms all the way down to 0.00128 nanograms, we can get a, a visible signal of the SARS-CoV-2 sequences, which shows that it is uh, reasonably sensitive. And so having established all of this uh, in vitro and using um, a virus that has been grown in vitro, what we, what we wanted to do is to um, see if we can detect SARS-CoV-2 in clinical swab samples. So that's uh, really the main aim. And here we've uh, used uh, swabs so that's uh, transported in uh, universal media. So this is unpurified sample. Uh, we've done some heat inactivation for safety reasons. And then using this sample, we've uh, put it through 30 minutes of RT lamp uh, amplification and then Cas12A detection of the viral E gene. So we've got six samples here. The first two, they are the positive uh, samples and then three and four are negative samples. Uh, five and six are the respectively positive control and negative control samples. And what we found is that the positive samples, which were uh, in red and dark green. So these are patient samples one and two, and they were positive and tested by RT-PCR. And here again, they're confirmed by RT-LAM-CAS12A in 30 minutes, essentially, that they are positive as well. And uh, this here is just a positive uh, viral control in light green. So the next step is to uh, work with our collaborator Exin, and we are trying to implement this whole system in a uh, chip format. So basically uh, having a little chip where we can uh, input our sample here, and then this um, undergoes uh, 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 the different Cas12A amplification and detection reactions in these different chambers. It gets put through uh, into this machine, which then reads it out as a fluorescent signal. So that's something that's ongoing and hopefully we'll have more data to share in the future. So in the next couple of slides, I just want to give you a bit of an update on the landscape of CAS-12A rapid uh, diagnostic testing um, of SARS-CoV-2 and also CAS-13. So in this paper here that's been described uh, in Nature Biotechnology, what they've done is that uh, in a very similar uh, approach to us, they've uh, amplified the SARS-CoV-2 sequences using RT lamp. But instead of using a fluorescent reporter, what they've used is a lateral flow reporter to look at the presence of these um, viral sequences. So this is very similar to a pregnancy test strip uh, it's very user friendly. You can do this uh, at home, essentially. Uh, and this is how it works. Is that in the presence of uh, the viral sequence, Cas12 then cleaves this uh, reported sequence, which is FAM and biotin labeled. Uh, in the negative control, that gives you a ban uh, at the first stop line. But in the positive samples, what happens is it, when you do get cleavage, uh, this uh, FAM probe then migrates down and gets um, bound to this uh, second line, which is then classified as a positive sample. 
And that's what it looks like here. So that's a control line and you get sample flowing through. Um, and that's a positive line here. That's a positive sample. That down here is a negative sample. So you don't get the second line being positive. And really, you just need two heat blocks, one at 62 and one at 37. Um, your lateral flow strips and PCR tips. Uh, and you can basically uh, do this um, very, very easily. And the sensitivity of this assay is also, also really good. Uh, it goes all the way down to about 10 copies uh, per microliter. So the limit of detection is um, really uh, quite sensitive uh, as compared to uh, RT-PCR. So it's a bit less sensitive, uh, which is uh, RT-PCR goes down to about one copy per microliter, uh, whereas the limit of detection is about 10 for the RT-LAMP uh, CAS-12A assay. The other thing about the CAS-12A detection assay is that although the RT-LAMP uh, steps are a single isothermal reaction at 65 degrees, the actual CAS-12A readout of these amplicons uh, is actually at 37 degrees. That's because CAS-12A has been optimized to work best at this temperature. So what this group has done uh, is uh, published in the NHAM last year, is that they've used a CAS-12 variant known as AAP CAS-12B, which is now active at 62 degrees. And this really then offers a truly one pot uh, detection solution uh, for um, the RT-LAN protocol. So this minimizes contamination, min simplifies the workflow, and really um, takes it one step closer for you to uh, even do this uh, at home yourself in a, in a home-based testing kit. And they've also used magnetic, magnetic beads uh, to, uh, to give you um, even more concentrated and clean sample, uh, improve sensitivity. And uh, out of the 202 uh, positive samples, they were able to detect 188 uh, of them being positive by this method. The other thing that has been published uh, recently is the use of amplification-free detection of the SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, using CAS-13 this time, um, and interestingly using a mobile phone to make it even more user-friendly. So uh, using CAS-13, they are able to directly detect um, the viral RNA itself. So without the need of reverse transcription and DNA amplification, they can just use the viral um, naked RNA um, as, a, as a substrate for CAS-13 detection. And this is a bit of a concept of what they've done using a uh, phone and also a fluorescent um, light source where they can then um, put the sample in, uh, shine a light on it to look at CAS-13 uh, collateral cleavage activity and uh, fluorescent signal. And the limit of detection is a bit, um, uh, it's not as, uh, as good as RT-PCR, which is about one. Uh, CAS-12A is about 10. And with CAS-13, without amplification, uh, it's about 100 to 1,000 copies per microliter uh, and five to 10 minute detection time. Uh, what they've also done is multiplex uh, different guide RNAs uh, in combination, as we've done, and that gives you a synergistic uh, result, giving you a, um, a higher fluorescent reading as compared to using them individually. Uh, in the next part of this talk, I'll be talking a little bit about uh, some of the work that's been done in the JAX uh, laboratory here at Weihai. This is work that's been done by Nijoy and Luis. Uh, what they've done is using CAS-12A uh, for wastewater surveillance of SARS-CoV-2 uh, here in Victoria. So it's been known for some time that the virus, uh, even though you're not infectious or if you are infectious, um, you do get the leakage of this virus from um, an individual in terms of excrement from, the, uh, from your nose or from your saliva and also from the feces itself um, into the wastewater system. Uh, what you can do is that you can collect um, samples from the wastewater and uh, to test whether it's positive for SARS-CoV-2 sequences. And this, in effect, acts as a bit of an early warning system to see if a population or certain regions are, um, are experiencing an outbreak of um, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, it can also uh, be very important for um, quarantine measures, um, uh, lockdowns, and so on. So basically what they've done is that they've uh, collected aliquots of, um, of wastewater from these uh, treatment plants. They've then um, purified and extracted the RNA and then use uh, that for reverse transcription and RTQPCR 
uh, for amplification and validation by CAS12A. So the two genes we've looked at are the N gene and the ORF1A uh, B gene. We've amplified that, um, verified that by RT-PCR. And then after this step, uh, there are two options for them. They could either uh, sequence it by uh, amplicon sequencing using next generation sequencing. Uh, that would involve a 16 to 48 hour um, workflow to re-verify the sequences that are positive in the RT-PCR. Or they could use CAS12A to re-verify that, uh, resulting in only a two to three hour workflow. So most of the uh, validations have been done using CAS12A uh, simply because it's faster and they can get a same day result to update the DHHS um, of the status of the uh, different water samples. So and this is a bit of uh, a summary of the results they've got so far. An example, uh, you can see here, that's a positive control on top. And uh, samples one to six here, you can see they're positive for um, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 sequences as detected by CAS12A. Um, and these are the negative controls here below. And sample test number two, uh, you can see the same thing. That's positive control. And these um, five samples here, the positive and the negative controls set out here. So you can see the system works well for validating these uh, PCR amplicons. And you can actually visit this site here, the DHHS site, the wastewater testing site for SARS-CoV-2 uh, COVID-19. Uh, this is the site where they publish uh, the data of um, the water uh, wastewater testing. And they actually have a, a map uh, where they show um, the presence or absence of uh, the detection of the virus. And uh, as we speak today, um, I'm recording this towards the end of uh, May, where we have our seven day uh, lockdown here in Melbourne. And as you know, uh, there was uh, this um, outbreak uh, where the northern suburbs were uh, mostly affected by the presence of um, SARS-CoV-2. And you can see here uh, in this uh, heat map, uh, the presence of uh, the virus was detected in the wastewater um, of these northern suburbs um, uh, on this day. So the other thing that we did using CAS12A was to see if it can detect uh, the presence or absence of a single base mutation. And as a proof of concept, what we did was to try and detect a single base mutation in P53. This is the R273H mutation. And what you can see here is that using the guide RNA for the mutation, we can distinguish the presence of this uh, mutant amplicon as compared to the wall type amplicon in red. And showing this here, you, again, you can, that's the mutant amplicon. That's 100% mutant amplicon in red as uh, being positively detected. And on the other scale, on, on the side of the scale, we have um, the wall type amplicon uh, in black. So that's your baseline reading. And basically dilutions of the mutant amplicon with the wall type, you can see that even down to one in one million uh, dilution of the mutant amplicon, you can still distinguish it over the wall type. Uh, amplicon. So the reason we were interested in this is because, of course, uh, as you're aware, there are multiple variants of the coronavirus. Um, these are all characterized by uh, single point mutations in mostly the spike protein. So that's the spike protein here, uh, which confers um, more infectivity of these variants compared to the wall type strains. And there are a number of these variants around, you know, the UK variant, uh, the South Africa variant, and Brazilian variant, among others, including uh, others like the Indian variant as well. Um, and these uh, variants um, are characterized by single base um, mutations, as I've mentioned. And this is the example of the UK variant N501Y, where you have an A to U mutation in the viral RNA. So we wanted to see if we could detect this using CRISPR-Cas. Uh, 12a as well. And so this is uh, what we found We're using a wall type guide RNA. That's the wall type control in blue. That's what we expect uh, in blue and pink. These are both wall type sequences. And then with the uh, mutant sequence in green, you can see that there's uh, the ability to distinguish between the wall type and mutant sequence using the wall type guide. And conversely, if you use the mutant guide RNA, you can see that it detects the mutant sequence most strongly, whereas it detects the wall type sequences in blue and pink um, less strongly, and you can distinguish between the two. Uh, we're trying to make this system uh, more accurate and sensitive and trying to 
get more of a discrimination between these um, different sequences. Right, so in this uh, slide, I'm just going to summarize what we've talked about so far. So using the RT-QPCR test, um, the difficulty is, is rather high as you need specialist equipment and techniques to, to use this. Uh, diagnosis time is uh, rather lengthy, but uh, the sensitivity is unparalleled. It's really the most sensitive test we have. And you're able to use this for early and advanced detection of the disease. Now, compared to the RT-PCR test, which is really the gold standard, uh, we also have the CAS-12 rapid diagnostic test. This uh, isn't here to replace the RT-PCR test, it's here to complement it as um, uh, to be used in parallel. And the reason for that is that it's um, very simple to do the test, um, it's very quick to do the test, and although there's some sacrifice in the sensitivity, um, the fact that it's so simple and quick to do uh, would allow you to do it um, many times more frequently as compared to the RT-PCR test. And also the fact that you can get the results on the same day at the, on the spot um, while waiting um, for, for certain um, events such as, um, such as quarantine requirements or when you're passing through borders or at the GP clinic or things like that. So because of that, uh, we think that this can be used much more frequently and throughout the entire span of the infection of the virus. Uh, as a as a safeguard and in parallel to the um, RT PCR test, and so the uh, final thing that we can also do is a serology test. So that's uh, shown here. So this uh, involves a collection of uh, serum and looking at antibodies that have developed to the virus itself. Uh, this test is uh, relatively simple and quick. Uh, it's also slightly less sensitive as compared to RT-PCR, but uh, the advantage is that you're using it to, um, to detect the presence of the virus in different phase of the infection cycle, such as advanced uh, in, in infection phases and also during the recovery phase. So the other thing we want to point out here is that if the viral loads are very low, that is less than 10 to the 6 viral particles per mil, the chance of you being infectious or having a positive culture is uh, very low. In comparison, if you have high viral loads, more than 10 to the 6 particles per mil, this is when you get positive culture and infectivity. And this is where the CAS-12A detection threshold sits, so there's quite a bit of buffer here in terms of being able to detect uh, viral loads that are um, uh, that are relevant for infection. So basically what this shows is that all of these samples that are being missed out by CAS-12A detection, they are very, very unlikely to be transmissible and result in positive cultures anyway. The other important thing to note is that testing frequency is uh, often said to be more important than testing sensitivity. That is, the more you test, the better it is for the outcomes of a population. And this is modeled here where you can see that without any testing at all, you get peaks of about 6,000 6, infected individuals um, uh, being detected in this uh, sample set. Whereas if you have uh, testing that is um, relatively sensitive, but every seven days, this falls to about 800 or so. And this falls to further to about 300 by having a more sensitive test every seven days. So that's 10 to the three. But in this data set here, what it shows is that even if the test is less sensitive, so that's 10 to the five compared to 10 to the three, but now done every three days instead of seven days, this is when uh, you start to see the peaks start to fall to 20 or so counts um, per time point. So I've hoped, uh, I've hoped to show you the um, importance of diagnostics in trying to maintain and control this pandemic and end this pandemic, um, the importance of diagnostics in the uh, applications of contact tracing, uh, quarantine, and border control. And of course, it's, uh, it's an extremely important arm um, in, in, um, in ending the pandemic along with uh, vaccination, of course, where we have these um, various adenoviral vaccines uh, from AstraZeneca, for example, and also these lipid nanoparticle vaccines from companies like Pfizer. And in this final slide, um, I want to end with uh, talking a little bit about the advancements in the field of using CRISPR-Cas um, as direct interventions in antiviral therapy. 
Um, this is in contrast to what I've been talking about in using it for just diagnostics, but we can also use it as, uh, as therapeutic tools. So in this uh, diagram, what we're looking at here is like we have viruses such as uh, double-stranded DNA viruses, which can invade the cell and integrate into the genome. Uh, in this case, we can use a CRISPR-Cas protein such as Cas9 to interrupt the, um, the viral sequences and disrupt it. We can also use CRISPR-Cas9 to remove these viral sequences completely from the genome. Uh, at the same time, uh, single-stranded RNA virus that are also present can be um, targeted by uh, proteins such as Cas13, which can cut and destroy a specific RNA. So you can remove and destroy viral RNA sequences and viruses that are present within the infected cell. So this paper here uh, further goes on to show that where they uh, have lung epithelial cells and with um, Cas13D being present, they then place a guide RNA pool within the cells and then see whether they, uh, they can transduce these cells with SARS-CoV-2 uh, and whether the Cas13D can target it and make a difference in infectivity. And what they found is that using the pools of guide RNA, the F1 pool and the F2 pool, uh, they can find that they found an 81% decrease in the SARS-CoV-2 viruses and a 90% decrease uh, correspondingly. It shows that it's quite effective in uh, targeting and destroying the viruses in the cell itself. And this is a schematic of all coronaviruses that are present. So the viruses that infect humans, are, there are relatively few of them. They are, they are uh, described here, uh, but there are hundreds and hundreds of other coronaviruses that are present in other uh, animal species. Uh, each and every one of them, of course, they have uh, the potential to become a zoonotic and infect humans, uh, creating uh, the next pandemic. So what they've described here is uh, by designing just six guide RNAs, they were able to target um, 90 percent of all coronaviruses. So that really shows um, a promise and potential of uh, these therapeutics. But of course, there are other questions that have to be answered before this uh, goes into the clinic, such as uh, Cas9. Um, well, of course, you can have mutations after double-stranded DNA cleavage and how does this affect the genome. Uh, Cas13, uh, after cleaving the viral sequences, um, what about collateral RNAs activity? Uh, will that then cleave all endogenous RNA that's present in the cell? So that has to be uh, addressed as well. Of course, there are variants of these proteins that can be developed that uh, mitigate these um, challenges. Uh, but of course, there are also off targets that uh, have to be addressed. So these are all things that have to be worked on um, be before these applications become more mainstream um, and used in a clinic. But uh, I hope that gives you uh, an idea of what's being developed and a taste of um, uh, what the future brings with uh, this technology. So that remains, um, that leads me to thank um, my supervisor, Marco Harold, and also Ashley, uh, who has done a lot of the cas 12 8 work that I have mentioned in uh, this uh, seminar. Uh, the Pellegrini Lab, uh, Cody, James and Rima have supported us by providing uh, as with a lot of these samples, uh, MRFF, who have uh, provided funding for uh, this work. Uh, the JAX Laboratory, Nijo and Luis, they've been involved in the wastewater uh, detection work that I've shown you. Uh, Exxon, uh, who've uh, developed a machine the, together with us, uh, Blue Hopper in particular, and also uh, people from uh, Deb Williamson's uh, group in the PDI RMH, who have also provided samples uh, to us. So thank you so much for listening and um, I look forward to taking any of your questions in the upcoming uh, question and answer session. So thank you.